right? Good morning, everyone. Let's get started. It's 45 minutes before lunch, and if you're anything like me, you might be starting to get hungry a little bit already. But don't worry, I promise you it's going to be 45 entertaining minutes. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to discuss Dapper, the distributed application platform. And before we get started, uh, well, you know my name already because it's on the slide, so let's uh, skip that part. Um, I would like to ask you a favor, you as the audience. Yesterday, um, I flew in from, uh, from my home airport, which is Schiphol. And if you followed the news, it's been quite a disaster at Schiphol recently. So uh, a fellow Dutch uh, person reached out to me on Twitter and said, it's very dapper of you to fly out from Schiphol. It's in Dutch, as you can see. Um, but dapper in Dutch means courageous or brave. And then they challenged me, you're never going to put this tweet on in your slide deck, are you? And I said, might happen, might not. So my favor, the, the favor that I would like to ask you, could you please picture this? And if you're on Twitter, post it. And please tag at Edwindex and uh, at T.O. Buys with an underscore. I'd love them to get just a few, a handful of notifications. <laughs> I'll give you a few minutes, and in the meantime, I'll, I'll then introduce myself. So my name is Maarten Mulders. Um, I work in the Netherlands, as you might have uh, figured. I work at InfoSport. We're a consultancy company. Uh, as for myself, I'm a consultant, a trainer, and a technology advocate. As a consultant, um, well, I do consulting projects, of course. As a trainer, I teach fellow colleagues and customers of ours. And as a technology advocate, well, I'm here to tell you about Dapper. So, um, as I said, I'm a consultant. I'm, I'm often uh, working in the role as an, as an architect for projects. And uh, the one thing that I really love about that part of my job is the fact that I get to deal with a lot of complexity. And to be honest, that's really something that, that, that gets me up in the morning, knowing that I can tackle some really challenging, complex problems. But if we say complexity, we must be a little bit more precise, because I believe there are two types of complexity. One is essential complexity, which is inherited from your domain, from your problem. It's essential because if you don't solve it, you didn't solve the business problem at hand. So we must address these issues. And that's the interesting part, if you ask me. The less interesting part, or, well, the part that is, at least in my opinion, less interesting, is the accidental complexity. It's the, the complexity that we introduce ourselves. Because without even quite knowing what we're going to build, we've already decided, oh yeah, let's use Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is simple, I know, or, or is it? And, and we decide to go for microservices, because that's how you do it these days, right? And microservices are simple. Oh, well, well, you get it already. Um, I did a quick poll on the, on the Wova app. I'm not sure if you saw it. I posted it yesterday, and um, I just asked, hey, uh, what, what do you rather work on, the accidental complexity or the essential complexity? And roughly 75% said, well, I'd rather do the essential complexity and get rid of all the, the nitty-gritty details that somehow seem to come with the job, but that don't necessarily add business value. Let's look at a quick example. Imagine we, we are starting our project, and, and well, um, we know that we have uh, some part in our application that needs to store uh, some data. Uh, and the data is relatively simple. It's a key value pair, basically. So we, we, we have a primary key that we know from the domain, uh, and we have some value that we want to associate with that key. Now. Um, that's, that's an easy part. We want to be able to scale up, so that's why we, uh, that, uh, so that, uh, that's why we foresee to have multiple instances of our application, and we need to have one key value store. Simple as that, right? But what key value store are we going to use today? Depends a bit. Uh, if we're running on-premises, if we're running in the cloud, if, uh, what cloud, to be more precise? Uh, AWS or Azure has different uh, products for it, uh, but we can also use a traditional relational database, which will work probably just as fine. Right? So far, we've, we've, asked, we've basically created a new question for ourselves, but I'm not sure if I'm already 
up to answer that question. Maybe on the road in the project, we'll learn more about what we actually are building and we will find out that a different key value store would have been more appropriate. Now in the company where I work, InfoSupport, there's a, there's a poster on the wall. And on the poster, there's me, as you can see here. Um, and on the poster, well, again, it's in Dutch. It says, um, is there, by the way, anyone who, who dares to make a guess what it says? <laughs> Dutchies are not allowed to, uh, to play. It says, architecture is all about making choices, but not too soon. It's better to make the choice later than sooner. And what I mean to say with this is, if you can postpone an architectural choice, it's often wise to do so, because, as I said, going on with your project, there may be more stuff that you learn about what you're actually building. And you might want to reconsider the choices that you have made earlier. And there's, it, it would be very frustrating if at that point we found out that we initially made a bad choice. So, Redis, PostgreSQL, Hazelcast, I don't know yet. And actually, I don't want to decide either. Now, if we would have a standardized API that, that could just abstract away um, the concept of a key value store, maybe that would save us because then we could say, okay, uh, we'll, we'll program against the API, not against the implementation, and then it doesn't matter if we're doing JDBC with PostgreSQL or if we're using Redis, uh, using the Redis driver. And if you're around in the industry for a little while, and you hear standardized API for whatever external thing, you might be like, hey, wait a minute. Isn't that a dinosaur entering the room? I mean, there's only good things to be said about Jakarta EE. Let's, let's be very clear about that. But it has its age. It originated even before I entered the job market. Uh, as the Java 2 Enterprise Edition platform. And its documentation then said that it was an integrated standard for implementing and deploying portable multi-tiered enterprise applications. The portable, that's a very interesting part here, because it promised us that we could write our application against a standard API, the Java uh, EE APIs, and we could then port it to another platform and it would still run. Wow. So if we had something like that, but then for the problem we just saw, the key value store, that would be great. Once again, I'm not saying Jakarta EE is bad. It's a terrific project. It's just that it's relatively old. Now, if we look at a Jakarta EE application nowadays, this is how it typically gets deployed. We have our application, which is our Java code compiled into class files, which runs in a Jakarta EE container, say Wildfly, Open Liberty, Pajara, which runs inside a Java virtual machine, which runs inside a Docker container, which runs on a hypervisor. And that's quite a few layers of abstractions, isn't it? There, there, there's all things going on in each of those containers, container, container and we don't know about them, and, and maybe we don't want to know about them either. So I'd rather see something a little simpler than adding yet another container to something that is already layered with multiple layers, like an onion of, of containers. And this is where the distributed application runtime shows up, which is what Dapper is the acronym for. It's, um, join, it's in the process of joining the CNCF, as we speak, the Cloud Native Compute Foundation. Um, and its, its tagline is that it, is that it provides you with an event-driven and portable runtime for building microservices that run both on cloud and on edge, or premises, if you wish. So let's open that box of Dapper and see what's inside. This is like the ingredient list that you will find on a, on a packet of, uh, of, of, of crisps. Or, if you wish, it's kind of a buzzer bingo. Because Dapper is open source. Yay. Polyglot. Another yay. Modular. 
If it's not modular, why would you want it? It's pluggable. That's also great. And of course, you can't sell a product nowadays if it's not cloud native, can you? I mean, really, can you? Can, can, can you say that it's not cloud native? So there's quite a few things, and just to be sure, there may be traces of nuts and gluten and other allergens, but I'm not 100% sure about these. But if you add a disclaimer, then, then you're safe, right? So in a nutshell, it's, it's, it's really, um, uh, it, it sounds promising, from, uh, from the perspective of, of what you will find on the website and what is on the, on the box. But what's inside the box? Well, Dapper is built around the concept of a building block. And a building block is um, effectively, it's a, it's a description of a cross-cutting concern that you may run into when you build distributed systems. So if we go back to my initial example, um, a a cross-cutting concern is I need to store a piece of data uh, as a key value pair. I will probably need that on a lot of places in my distributed landscape. Maybe not in all places. And wherever I need it, I probably want to do it the same way or at least in a similar way. And ideally, I do not want to implement it every single time again. Now, what Dapper does, it provides you with a REST-based API, which is the, the building block API in this case. Uh, I said it's REST, so that means we can add, um, access it using HTTP. And what we do here, we do a POST to the state API, because that's how the building block API is implemented. Uh, vehicles, that's the name of uh, the, the, the uh, the instance of the API, which is running on localhost 3500. We'll get back to that in a few minutes. And I'm going to provide a, a piece of JSON data, which in this case is a key, which is a license number for a Dutch car. The car is no longer uh, on the road, by the way, because it's very old. Uh, and apparently, I have a payload, which happens to be JSON as well, but it could literally be anything. In this case, it's pure coincidence that it is JSON, and we recognize the license number again and the entry timestamp. So uh, there's another endpoint on the same API, um, which again uses the state and uh, the name of the state store. And this time, I'm going to do a lookup on the key, the same key that I entered before using the post. And now I'm doing a get. And I will, be, uh, will get an answer, which is literally the value that I stored here. So it's this piece. It's not the key. It's not the, the, the curly braces or the square braces around it. It's only the value which I get back. And it happens to be JSON again. No surprise there. But again, this is coincidence. It could also have been base64 encoded gRPC data or whatnot. Now, this, this 3500, where does that come from? Localhost 3500. If you start using Dapper, you need a sidecar. And the sidecar is, as the name suggests, an application component that runs side to side with your actual application component. So here we have our application component. That's where the Dapper sidecar is running. And the Dapper sidecar implements all those building blocks. Using REST APIs, you can access them. How do you access them? I said REST APIs. Not 100% sure, because you can 100% correct, sorry. Because you can also access them over gRPC if you prefer. But that's a bit hard to show because it's a binary protocol. So that's why I'm using the REST examples here. So the sidecar is something that runs next to your application. And you can access it from your application. And if you do choice, choose to be running on Kubernetes, you can actually package both of them as a container, combine them up in a pod, and then deploy the pod. And the pod will consist of your application container and your sidecar container, and they will be happily living together. As I said, the building block exposes um, a standardized API, but how is it implemented? Well, the, uh, in case of the building block, uh, the state building block, there's a couple of implementations, and it's not a uh, coincidence 
that they line up with the examples that I mentioned at the beginning. So there's a Redis-based implementation, there's a Hazelcast-based implementation, there's a PostgreSQL-based implementation, and so on and so forth. There's a bunch of implementations that all provide you with a key value store, but the interesting part is that the REST API and the gRPC API do not change depending on which implementation that you chose. So your application talks to the gRPC endpoint or the REST endpoint using standardized protocols and standardized APIs, and at runtime, you choose which implementation to power it. Am I choosing Redis today, or am I preferring PostgreSQL today? You could say it's kind of a service mesh, but on steroids. It's, it's actually better. Service meshes um, typically intercept traffic and add, maybe add some metrics to it or whatnot, but this service mesh is actually adding behavior to your application, behavior that you do not have to implement anymore. So let's get started and let's look at a simple example. The example I'm showing you here is, um, uh, again, I'm Dutch, uh, uh, is, is taken from my reality, which is that if I drive over a, a highway, there will be installations like these, and this is taken uh, in hindsight, and what you can see is there's a little camera for each lane. And the camera will detect my car when I drive under it, register my license plate, uh, and then a few kilometers ahead, there's a similar installation with the cameras, and they will also register that I was there, and given the distance between those two, they can calculate how fast I drove and whether I deserve a speeding ticket or not. That's the domain we're building. Oh, here's a little example to illustrate just that. Uh, so we have two cameras, one at the entry and one at the, uh, at the exit. They both talk with a traffic control system, which is just getting the camera images or actually the, the, the timestamps when I was here or when I was there. Um, if the traffic control system says, hey, that was a bit too fast, my dear friend, it will signal to the fine collection service, hey, this, uh, the, the owner of this vehicle drove too fast. Um, but the fine collection uh, service needs to know who's the owner of the car, happens to be me, and that's where the vehicle registration service comes in. So we're going to start a dapper sidecar, run the demo application, and look in a Redis key value store what it looks like. First step, we're going to start the sidecar. And just, uh, just quickly, um, it says I'm going to run, um, my, app my application will expose on port 6000, uh, and if somebody else wants to talk with my application, they can do over these other ports. Now I'm going to start the application itself manually. It's a Spring Boot application. And there we have it. And now I'm going to simulate that I drove in. Internal server error is not exactly the answer I was looking for, to be honest. Why is that? Dapper sidecar is running. Hmm. I don't see it immediately. If any one of you has a clue, then I'd love to hear you. Just shout. But I might want to restart the sidecar for a minute, but not sure if that's going to address. And otherwise, I'm just going to tell you what you were supposed to see. Sidecar's running, great. Traffic control service starting up. Okay, one more time, fingers crossed. No. Never mind. Um, what you were supposed to see and what I saw like 10 minutes before we started because I then double checked my demos, but apparently that's not enough. 
is um, that the system would talk, the, 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 the Spring Boot application would talk to the sidecar and say, hey, please put under this key a piece of data, the data being the entry timestamp. And then I would be going to um, traffic control service, and I would say XT346Y. And this is the Redis CLI, and it says there, as you can see, this is the license number, and the entry timestamp is that particular timestamp. And then I would, but that's probably not going to work either, but let's see. Into, yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry for this. Uh, it's, it's supposed to say OK, and then it would usually update um, this blob here and say license number XT blah, blah, blah. Entry timestamp is just this field, and then exit timestamp as well. And again, if the exit timestamp and the entry timestamp would have been too close to each other, then uh, it would signal that there was a speeding violation. But apparently the demo gods are not with me today, so I'm sorry for that. Thank you. So let's dive in, because there's a lot more to tell about Dapper. As I said, Dapper um, consists of many uh, 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 such building blocks or components, if you wish. Um, let's see what kinds we have. We already saw the state store in action, which is basically an abstraction over the concept of a key value store. There's service invocation to invoke remote methods. There's a pub sub mechanism to do async message processing. There are bindings that we can use to do external integrations like email or Twitter or whatnot. Um, there's support for secret stores, so um, uh, for anything password-like or private key-like, you could put it in a secret store. Naming resolution, which is basically an enabler for many of the other things, and middleware. At this point, there's roughly 27 different implementations of each and every of those building blocks and they're still building more and more. Part of them are considered really stable and supported by the Dapper community. Some are in contribution phase, which means somebody wrote it. It works, but that's all we can say about it. Um, there may be glitches, you may be on your own, but given that it's all open source, it's relatively easy for you to dive in and see what's going on and where it goes wrong. I actually had an issue with the, uh, the SMTP binding where the documentation and the code were not completely in sync. Well, given that it's all open source, I could inspect the source code of the SMTP binding, see that the documentation was wrong, um, provided a patch for the documentation, and then everything worked. Let's dive into a few more in, in a bit more detail. Service invocation is basically the classic example of two applications wanting to talk to one another in a blocking way. So an application sends a request to another application and just waits for the response. Now, there's many ways you can do this. You can do this over HTTP, over gRPC. You can even use SOAP and XML if you're feeling adventurous or if you're feeling old-fashioned like I typically do. Um, but they're all addressing the same problem, aren't they? There's PubSub, which is the uh, abstraction over the concept of, hey, I have an application. Something is happening in this application, and I just want the world to know. Who exactly? I don't know. I don't care. Whoever is interested can subscribe to it, and once they subscribe, they will know whenever I publish. So, hey, somebody drove too fast. I don't know who needs to know this, but everybody who wants to, just subscribe on the topic and you'll get notified whenever it happens. There are bindings, as I said, uh, SMTP is a nice example. You can even invoke uh, remote web services. And there's also, and that's an interesting one, there's a cron binding. As you can see, these two bindings are outgoing, so the application invokes the binding, and then the binding does something, send out an email, invoke a web service. But the cron binding is incoming. So the cron binding is basically a scheduler 
that just triggers on certain moments and invokes an endpoint on your application, notifying your application that it is about time to do a particular piece of work. This is what Spring, um, uh, Spring uh, Scheduler does for you, or Quartz does for you, but then without using Spring. Not everybody uses Spring, after all. And, and of course, many other frameworks have support for this as well. But you don't even need a framework if your platform can actually just signal to you, hey, it's the first day of the month, it's 12 o'clock in the morning, everybody should have submitted their timesheets by now. If not, send the people who did not an email, outgoing binding, and tell them to submit their timesheets ASAP, PS, CC their manager. Uh, and finally, there's, um, there's a, a, a binding for managing secrets, as I said, which, um, if you run it locally, that's very funny, it, it will be powered by a JSON file, which is not encrypted at all, it's not even secure in, in any way, because it just lives here on my machine. But if you run in a, uh, in a cloud environment, then you will often have uh, a key management service for you. But you don't want to program against that particular product of that particular vendor. So the secret binding, again, is an abstraction that says, I want access to a particular secret and how exactly it is stored and which API I need to invoke to get it. I don't want to know and I don't want to care about it. So, I have a second demo planned, and let's hope this one's running better than the first one, um, where I'm uh, going to show you service invocation and output bindings. Again, as a quick reminder, this is the scenario we are talking about. Entry cam, exit cam, traffic control service, fine collection service, vehicle registration service. And what we're going to do, we're going to start uh, the, those applications with their sidecars in one step, and then we're going to run a separate program that simulates some traffic um, which should eventually lead to speeding tickets in my mailbox. So we start with um, the vehicle registration service, which just gives owner information on a particular vehicle registration number. Um, it is now started, which is invoked using um, um, uh, service invocation from the fine collection service, which we are going to start right now. And then we have our friend, the traffic control service, which gets the information from the cameras. And if it says, hey, you drove too fast, it will do pub sub and will publish somebody drove too fast, which will in turn be picked up by the traffic, uh, by the um, fine collection service. So now that we have all of this up and running, it's time to start our simulation. Please cross your fingers with me that it will work today. It will work this afternoon, actually. It simulates a few. There's the first exit. Let's see, let's see, let's see. No exceptions there, that's good. No exceptions here, that's good as well. But we also see um, that some people already got their first speeding tickets. So this is looking good. Let's check my mailbox because all of them arrive in the same mailbox. And indeed, 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 we have speeding tickets for people that drove too fast. You drove 15 kilometers per hour too fast, which is going to cost you a whopping 130 euros. I'm not sure if the tariffs are actually aligned with the Dutch tariffs for speeding. And sometimes, if we're lucky, we might even... Yes, this is really a speedy one. Uh, this is so fast that the system says, <laughs> see you in court, man. The prosecutor will tell you once we meet. So that's great. Demo works. I'm not going to stop it, um, because we have a third demo later on. So I'm just, I'll just keep it running for now, because now it works. Don't touch it. You know how that goes. Any questions so far, by the way? Because I'm talking a lot. Is, is it all clear? Just, just a quick, uh, are, you, are you still with me, or are you eagerly awaiting your lunch already? One question. Could you please use the microphone so everybody can hear if, if that's not too... Oh, 
there's somebody who's going to run to you. Oh, well. Okay, no, my yes, please. My question is if the, um, if the ports or the sidecars has some, some coordination, if there are many, for example, a cron, uh, if I want that just one make a cron call and the others remain silent because I want just, just one leader uh, make that cron make that job and the other ones don't do that, that's, that's this kind of coordination between jobs could be done inside the... Could, could you do data. coordination which instance is going to pick up yeah, the cron for example, job? Which one, if I want it, have yeah. more nodes, if just one, I want just one to make the cron yeah. and the other ones remain silent. That's an interesting question. I don't know the answer from heart, to be honest. I do think you will need some coordination between your application instances okay, to do okay. that. Okay. Okay. Thanks for your question, by the way. It's an interesting one uh, because it's, it's a very realistic one. This just happens all the time. All right, because there's one more thing that I would like to show you in the remaining roughly 18 minutes, and this is all about observability. If there's one cross-cutting concern that I really like to see in distributed systems, it's observability, which in my point of view is about two things. It's about being able to trace traffic through your system and to collect metrics about your system. So tracing, this is how typically tracing works. Whenever a re request comes in at the first application instance that hits it from the outside, it will uh, inject a few extra headers. Could be HTTP headers, for instance, but if you use other transport mechanisms, it could be other headers. Um, and every component in your distributed landscape is supposed to just pass on those headers and enrich them with a few bits extra information. And then periodically, another component, uh, in, in my demo, this is going to be Zipkin, will collect these traces from all your application components and provide a nice visualization, a nice graphical way to see how traffic flows through your system. Now, as I said, this is data that needs to be passed on from com component to component to component. And if you use uh, frameworks like uh, sp uh, Spring or, or Quarkus, it probably has a built-in, but you don't always use these kind of frameworks and it still requires configuration. Then the second part is metrics. And metrics is all about numeric measurements of what your application does. Um, it could be uh, simple things like how many uh, users did sign up or how many orders did we place. could be business measures, by the way, and could also be infrastructural measurements, like uh, how much uh, CPU are we using, how much memory are we using, how much instances of this particular uh, application have, do we have running. And then um, the application uh, just emits those metrics and says, hey, that's one extra order placed, hooray, hooray. And then again, we have different components in our landscape that, uh, for instance, Prometheus, which will collect these measurements uh, by scraping and provide time series for it. And then we can use a tool like Grafana, again, to visualize and create nice dashboards that make our business users happy because, oh, look at that, we can see the, the flow of, of, of orders. We can see how many orders we had. We can see how many cancellations we had, whatnot. Depper, by the way, exposes a few extra metrics about itself. So this is really meta information from Depper about itself. It tells, it, it emits metrics about how much CPU is my sidecar using. Um, if I have uh, secured my Depper environment and require all the traffic to be uh, encrypted with mutual TLS, uh, how does the certificate issuing go? Are there uh, many certificate requests? Are they fulfilled or not? And in general, how is my sidecar doing? So the metrics might look like this. This is a, a, a just, just an example dashboard from the Dapper documentation, where we can see, hey, the uptime um, is, is just steadily increasing. Well, it means my system is running good because I don't see any reboots. Uh, CPU usage, pretty stable. Uh, memory usage, pretty stable, et cetera, et cetera. But for the tracing, this is where things get a bit hairy. Um, imagine we were doing the, the vehicle registration service, 
uh, and uh, our vehicle registration service, whoops, um, um, no, I have to say it correctly, our traffic control system wants to invoke the vehicle info si uh, method on the vehicle registration service using this license number. So that's how the URL is built up. There's who am I going to call, which method am I going to call, and do we have any parameters? Now, in its current state, it would require you, as the Java developer, to insert the XDAPR request identifier headers and a few others. That's not so cool. Luckily, Dapper provides an SDK for that. And the SDK makes it already a bit easier to, uh, to do these kind of invocations because I don't have to remember the REST API for calling another endpoint or another method. I can just say, this is the system that I want to invoke. Uh, this is the method. Uh, I don't have any request body. It's a get operation, and I expect to get back some vehicle information. And then using dot context write, I can add tracing information, which I collect from Open Tracing or Spring Sleuth. And this is still a bit hairy, if you ask me. I would expect, and I was actually for long under the expectation, that the Dapper SDK would automatically do this. Because I was told by one of my colleagues who works with Dapper on .NET that it just works out of the box. And I was like, shut up and take my money. If it works out of the box, I want to have it. Turns out that the SDK for Java is not really on par feature-wise with the .NET SDK, which is partially because in the Java world, uh, and you all know that, we have many ways to do, for instance, HTTP client calls. There's, there's a bunch of, of uh, uh, SDKs and libraries and, and whatnot that allow you to do an, an, an HTTP call to another system. And the Dapper SDK makes no choice in this and says, yeah, whatever works for you, my friend. And the same goes for uh, context tracing. It says, whatever works for you, you just have to inject it manually. I actually proposed to the people who maintain the Dapper SDK, let's think about if we can simplify this, because this doesn't make sense. If I have to do this every single time, chances are 100% or even higher that I'm going to forget it at least once and probably a few times. And then it doesn't work anymore. It only works if we do it every single time. So here, as that, that's my personal opinion, um, it's, it's really lagging behind. You'd expect it to, um, to automatically be wired together. Uh, maybe uh, when I construct the Dapper client or even better automatically, but that may be a bridge too far for now. Also, the Dapper SDK has a custom Spring Boot integration, which lets you do, for instance, a pub -sub -sub subscriptions with uh, not too much code. Adding a topic mapping to your method and saying, hey, I would like to be subscribed to the speeding violations topic on the pub sub which is named PubSub, what's in the name after all, will automatically invoke this method using a re request body and give you the event which contains the data that was published by the other component. Right. The demo should still be running, so if all went well, we should have a few Zipkin traces by now. Let's see, this is Zipkin. I'm going to run a query here. And I'm going to see what happens when somebody hits the exit cam here. Wow, just look at that. The traffic control system was invoked on the exit cam binding from the camera, right? Uh, this triggered a post on the traffic control surface, which uh, did a get state on a depper runtime to actually see if the vehicle was observed before, then do a save state with the new data and then do a publish event. By the way, please notice that these times are insanely fast. This is one millisecond. This is 135 microseconds. This is really fast, and that's actually what I like to see because a sidecar is an additional component, 
Um, and if there's one thing that I do not want, it should not slow down my application. Anyway, to continue the path through our landscape, we can see that it then uh, invokes the pub sub, uh, which triggers a post on the collect find method, which does a vehicle, uh, which does a surface invocation on the vehicle registration surface, collect the license number, and finally um, uh, publish uh, the, the email. All right, um, let me see. Observability. So, let's get back to our original question. Is D Dapper a dinosaur? Old stuff that we already know for 20 plus years. Nothing new here to see, just move along. Or is Dapper a developer's dream? Is this the best thing since sliced bread or maybe even before sliced bread? Uh, and should we all start adopting it today? It may come to no surprise that it's not a dinosaur, exactly. And for me, the main reason to say it's not a dinosaur is that this is not the same as Jakarta EE. Jakarta EE lets you abstract over technologies. So it says, whatever database you're using, here's JDBC. Whatever message bus you're using, here's JMS, and so on and so forth. So given that I already know I'm using a relational database, here is a vendor-independent API to work with it. Where Depper says, I don't know what technology you're going to use or what product is underneath it, but here's a standardized API for a concern that you have, something that you want to achieve. All right, then on with the developer's dream. Is Depper a developer's dream come true? I would say, no, it's not, neither. Sure, it has its advantages, and there's a few very promising developments here that I'm really enthusiastic about, but to me, the integration, especially on the Java platform, is just not on par. It's not what we would like to see, it's not what we expect nowadays, in terms of how fast you can get started and how much works out of the box. Sure, you can get it working eventually. I mean, you saw the Zipkin demo, so eventually I got it working but it requires quite a bit of code, which I'd rather not write every single time. It's time to wrap up. Um, if you leave the room, there's a few things that I would like you to remind about Depper. So what Depper is, it's a building block. It provides you with building blocks for building distributed applications that address common patterns in dist distributed architectures. Second, it's all powered by a Depper sidecar. The sidecar is the one that powers your, uh, your, your platform and makes it capable of achieving things that you would otherwise have to address inside your applications. And finally, Dapper is not a one-stop shop. It's not a Swiss army knife. Remember that I said, hey, there's a state API, you can use it to, to work on PostgreSQL uh, as an implementation. Yes, that's true. But what if you want to do a different lookup in your state store, not on the primary key, but on the secondary key? Well, Postgres can do that. We all know it. Select whatever, from, table, where, another column. That does not let you do it, because that's not how a key value store works. So Dapper is definitely not going to do everything for you, but it is there for very particular purposes. If this all got you curious, I've got a workshop for you, uh, which is open on GetUp. You can just follow it whenever you feel like it. I created it with a colleague of mine. Um, it's a step-by-step, -step, and you have the choice for yourself to either do it uh, self-paced and just figure it out with the documentation as your friend, or to do it in a step-by-step -step fashion and say, okay, just tell me what to do and why I should do it, and then I'll perform the steps and see how the application changes under my hands. It's totally up to you how you want to do it. With that, we have four minutes and 50 seconds left. I would like to thank you for attention. Oh, wait, this is just the legal stuff that I took, didn't take the photos myself. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, there are still microphones. I'd love to hear some of your questions or thoughts. Please, anyone. Great talk, thanks. Uh, 
Well, I, I just heard of Depper now. So if it's uh, on the market for quite a few years, could you name, like, I mean, in your opinion, reasons for not being that widespread, not being so popular? Maybe reasons why it's know. not so popular yet. I think part of that is um, the fact that, uh, and, and, and this is not per se technical, by the way. It, it, it was originally envisioned by a few folks at Microsoft. And you know, Java and Microsoft, they used to be not so very close friends. Uh, let's be honest, a lot has improved since then, but they're still, they're kind of like separated worlds sometimes. It, I know in the .NET world, this is quite a big thing, and, and uh, there's quite a few big companies already using it. But that's a different world, a world different from ours somehow, um, and, and, and that information didn't quite cross the boundary. I don't, I don't know why exactly that is not the case. I heard about Dapper through a few colleagues of mine who do .NET consulting, and they were enthusiastic about it. Hey, look at that, man, there's a Java SDK for it. Why don't you use it? Well, because nobody told me about it, just like you said. And then you start diving in, and you're like, yeah, okay, I can see the power of this, I can see what this would bring, but hmm, let, let's, let's put it to the test. And then you start observing that some things are hmm, maybe not as promising as they sounded. And that's, I think, is the second reason. In all honesty, and I've said it before, the integration for Java is just not on par with other platforms. Or actually, I should say it the other way around. The .NET integration is superb, and everything works out of the box. But on all other platforms, like Go, Rust, Python, Java, they are doing an effort, but it's just not complete. It's, it's not the real thing yet, and I think that doesn't help. It, if you want to convince people nowadays, you shouldn't have a demo that says, oh, by the way, add these 20 lines of code. It should be like, you just add this Maven dependency and you're done, right? That's what we expect. Uh, so I think there's two main reasons uh, why it ha doesn't have a lot of popularity in the Java world. Do you think that like um, these frameworks like Spring, Micronaut, Microprofile uh, specification, will you make it harder or maybe easier to get that apparently harder? That's an interesting question. Um, there is already quite a bit of competition between like the, the Springs and the Jakartas and the Micronauts and the Quarkuses and whatnot. This is, well, it, it makes it harder for the Dapper people to provide good integration. As I said, in the, in, the, in the .NET world, there's one thing for JSON serialization. You just use Newton. Nobody questions that. Everybody uses New, uh, Newton. In the Java world, we can have a war on Micronaut versus Halidon, not to mention Quarkus or Jakarta or Spring or what else do you have? And I, that makes it very challenging for them to provide good integrations because the last thing that they want to do, and I've actually had the conversation on GitHub, we don't want to integrate everything into the Dapper SDK because the Dapper SDK would be huge, immensely, and that it would be unmaintainable for us. So I think in a way it's hindering. But yeah, if you, time will tell. You also had a question, sir. Okay, <laughs> I thought you were shifting up, like I want to be next. All right, we've got 30 seconds left. I would like to thank you again. Please enjoy your lunch, enjoy the remainder of JBCNConf, and if you have any questions left, just look me up on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Find me in the hallway, and have a great day in general. Thank you.